I was um, I was googling some uh, some of the pictures of Portland. So I can put this on. That's on the, the wrong Portland. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, this actually uh, uh, is the Portland uh, lighthouse in uh, uh, Cape Elizabeth in Maine. So yeah, it's probably a wrong one. But um, anyway, I have a I have a, I have a proper one. I think my clicker died. Like it's okay. I will just uh, advance it further. <laughs> All right, so this is proper Portland, right? This is a correct picture. I'm not, I'm not from here. <laughs> I am uh, I am from uh, I'm from New Jersey, and um, I'm really excited to be here. And I heard that uh, the weather was especially you know very good for my visit. So thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is uh, this is how you can find me. This is a Twitter account. Um, you have a Twitter. Okay, so you can contact with the rest of the people. There's a thing called Twitter. Uh, you probably can, you know, Google it. Uh, there's a Twitter for uh, the Portland Journal and Confluent. Um, and it's me. I work as a developer advocate at Confluent. Uh, basically, what I do, I just go places and talk to developers about things, um, all things Kafka, basically related. Um, but I also Java, all things JVM guy for for a very long time. So I'm kind of going also in the Java user groups. Um, and um, the, so you can participate because it's a raffle in Twitter. So I'm going to be raffling something. Uh, if you follow me in Confluent, you will be tweeting pictures from this uh, event in Twitter. Uh, and uh, you will tag me there. And after that, you also tag this, uh, the Portland Jug. You will have a chance to win uh, some of the special prize from me. Um, and I would like to say special thanks to my colleagues from Confluent, Gwen Shapira. Uh, anyone knows Gwen? So, like, go follow her if you have a Twitter. You have a Twitter, so you need to follow <laughs> Gwen because she is an amazing person and uh, she talks all things Kafka as well. Uh, and Matthias, uh, he's a lead on uh, Kafka Streams project uh, and he also works with Confluent. And they they have a very significant contribution to the stock. Like, inspiration from the stock came from uh, from some of the work that uh, we did there. All right, so the quick agenda. What are we gonna be talking today? So we're gonna be talking about the Kafka Streams 101. So it's a Java user group. So I would like to talk about some of the Java framework for stream processing, right? The library that does stream processing. Um, obviously, every Java developer or every backend developer wants to know how to scale things and uh, loves performance and stuff. So we're gonna be talking about the internal things that you need to know when you're writing a Kafka Streams application in order to um, you know, scale this properly, okay? Uh, second thing, uh, the quick introduction to Kubernetes, only things that matter for this, uh, for this conversation, um, and some of the recommendations from Kafka Streams, all right, good? I think the next time, I, I try to collect all possible buzzwords and create the hype topic because it has a Kafka, Kubernetes, Kafka Stream, Stream Processing, Probably there's no Kotlin here, um, and maybe the project Growl, Growl VM, it's not there yet. Maybe it's the next time. Next year, it's going to be even more cooler. But um, this is demo uh, that I will be using today. Um, it's also a thing called QR code. If you have an iPhone, you can actually just show the, your camera on this QR code. You will get the URL. So you don't need to go and type this, but um, you can if you'd like. Um, again, if you, during the time of this presentation, decide to register in Twitter and tweet about this presentation to participate in Awesome Ruffle, my Twitter handle conveniently placed on every slide. In the <laughs> so, um, all right, so Kafka Streams 101. Uh, I missed the part when they, Ian asked how many people use Kafka or used Kafka or thinking about using Kafka or reading about Kafka, understand what's the Kafka. All right, so we have a couple of people. So Kafka is a event streaming platform. It's, um, it has a different uh, capabilities that uh, people can say, okay, it looks like a messaging system, it looks like a database, it looks like something else, because it really depends who you're talking to about Kafka. If you're talking to uh, the messaging guy uh, about Kafka, he will tell you, yeah, it's like a new thing about messaging and things like that. If you will talk to 
um, like database guy said, yeah, it looks like a database because it has a partition. Uh, you can uh, scale out. Um, topics have a partition. So you have uh, replicas, and it has a very strong consistency guarantees. Blah blah blah. Uh, if you're talking to someone else, you might have uh, some different answer. But essentially, uh, Kafka is a streaming platform. Uh, the streaming platform contains three pieces. Uh, it contains storage. So the Kafka provides. Uh, durability guarantee in the contrast of the messaging system where you just read the message from the queue and after that message will disappear. Kafka provides the way how this message will stay uh, for, for, uh, for a long time until you decide to do so. So streaming platform accumulates stream of events and these events are mutable so all, every message uh, will not be changed. If you want to change the some of the uh, events you need to send new event that kind of sort of supposed to change something. For example, you have a conversation where, with your significant other and you said something and you cannot change that. You already, you know, this, this message, this event already, you know, it's, it's, it's out. So only thing that you can do is just apologize, which sends another event. And it really depends how you will, you know, the system receiver <laughs> system will, you know, process this, how fast it will, you know, process and the state will change. So, Kafka is cool. Uh, we do have uh, awesome, um, awesome books about this documentation. So what we do in Confluent, we build uh, all things around Kafka. Because Confluent was founded by uh, original authors of Kafka back in the day. And the LinkedIn, they open source it and become Apache Kafka project. Um, another piece that, um, apart from storage and ability to store events, store this, uh, the, the, the things in Kafka, we have capabilities to do uh, processing. Um, the Kafka has a built-in library called Kafka Stream. So you're writing your apps, you include this Kafka Stream jar uh, that has a very rich set of capabilities. We're gonna be cover some of those. And uh, once you have this uh, stream of events from some other systems uh, um, that basically ingest it into Kafka through uh, framework called Kafka Connect. So Kafka, think about this, if you, again, if you're ETL person, uh, you can think about Kafka as a streaming ETL platform, as a, as a ETL 2.0, because you have, um, you have a ability to extract data, uh, you have ability to transform data, and the load some result of this one. So uh, this is full-blown uh, platform for you know, doing this kind of thing. So Kafka Connect is a framework that allows you to write connectors, so you don't need to write every time when you read something from Oracle, you don't need to write this code over and over again because there is a connector that allows you to do that without coding. Um, so we're gonna be focusing today only this, uh, this portion of the streaming platform. Uh, if you're interested in other aspects, we have uh, the blog in Confluent, uh, you can find some videos that I already did um, explaining certain things. And um, we're gonna be focusing about the Kafka, uh, Kafka streams. Now, uh, this is my uh, Kafka Streams application. This is how it looks like. And, and this is actually a full-blown application that does a lot of things. So we start with one uh, thing that we call, that we create a stream um, from, uh, from Builder. And the Builder, I will show some code later, but essentially it allows to build the so-called topology. Um, and after that, we have a stream. We have some of the processing logic. We'll take these events that uh, will contain information about uh, Traits, which uh, will have a ticker ID, it's going to be key here, and the value is going to be object job object trait. So we have this uh, stream of these uh, guys we, we're getting from Kafka, and often we start doing some processing. We do grouping, um, we do have, uh, there's the like ability to uh, have a grouping by key and have ability to have grouping by time. So we can extract the um, things from, uh, from message and uh, grouping by key. After that, we'll have this uh, result every five minutes, uh, five seconds, and advance by one second. So we will have a group of uh, um, stocks that will be grouped by key. And after that, we will be calculating what's the uh, running overage for, uh, for the last five seconds. Um, then this is how we can do aggregation. We have this, uh, uh, the container where we'll be storing the, the information. Um, we will pass information about um, this is our new values and the past values. And after that, we will add 
result uh, add a new thread <coughs> to um, um, to the storage. And this particular thing would be very interesting because um, you you might see something like this in, if you ever write a Java 8 uh, stream if, if you ever use the Java 8 uh, streams API and you did like some mapping function filtering. So the mapping filtering is so-called stateless stream processing. You don't need to have a result of the past in order to calculate result the current. Because you do just a transformation, you do filtering, you don't need to have something else. But for use cases like this, uh, where you need to do aggregation, uh, especially if you do aggregation within some time window, um, this thing will require some of the data from the past. You need to know how much uh, trades you calculate, uh, um, collected by particular key within certain time window. So we need to have a state somehow. And you, as, as you can see here, because it's the full-blown application, there's, not, uh, there's no only uh, public static void main, basically. Um, you don't see um, how this uh, data will be stored and where it will be stored. It's just because the Kafka Streams um, comes with batteries uh, inside. So Kafka Streams also have a small embedded database that called RocksDB that Kafka Streams will use to store local state. And uh, we're going to be like uh, diving deeper <coughs> into the things, how they work in terms of like how we provide a full tolerance. So this, you know, you can say, Victor, if our application will die, what's going to happen? So hold on for these questions because I will explain this. Uh, this is something Kafka Streams 101. Um, interesting thing that you might notice here, we have this uh, materialized uh, keyword that basically allows to specify the name of this uh, uh, database where we're going to be storing this information in this in this case uh, it's called um, trade aggregates now and after that when we calculated this we save result into Kafka so as you saw in my previous slide that um, there's no there's nothing here except only Kafka and uh, my application so and uh, this is very um, powerful diagram that allows you to see that there's no database involved here and Kafka basically will be used for storage. We're getting the, this question like can we use the Kafka as a, our storage? And to answer this how um, like the French people will answer we're drinking our own champagne, right? We're eating our own dog food so the framework it's embedded to Kafka it will use Kafka as a source it will use Kafka as a storage to, um, to write data to, um, to Kafka topics. Actually, I don't know if French people actually say that, but it sounds much better than uh, you know eating dog food. So uh, when we have this builder, this builder is actually responsible for for building this. Uh, that's okay. Uh, So-called uh, direct acyclic graph, and this graph uh, means that you have uh, certain steps, and uh, you specify how certain nodes of this graph would be connected. So it goes only one direction, so it's a directed. Um, a cyclic, it doesn't have any cycles, so everything goes only in one direction. And um, this, this thing called topology. So this is how it looks like, basically. So we start building this topology by uh, introducing uh, the, this thing called k-stream, which is Java object that has all these rich capabilities to do. But essentially, everything when we um, execute this um, this code, it will actually uh, compile or generate uh, low-level topology that will have a certain number of nodes, and how the data will go, your message will go through every node, and this message will be transformed. At some point, um, we might have one of the processor node might have uh, local storage to, to store the data in order to you know, calculate the results that, uh, that requires the data from the past. So uh, in this case, it will have this like, small, small database here. Um, so how is scale Kafka Streams application? So the, because it's not Kafka 101, and uh, I'm not going to go very deep into the consumer group protocol this is essentially how the Kafka also different from the messaging system where your consumer groups that uh, consumers can group um, consumer group 
and uh, based on number of partitions in your topic, uh, you can have a read uh, parallelism, basically. So the way how it works, we have a, a Kafka topic that has a certain number of partitions. So in this particular case, we have a four number of partitions. And the way how Kafka consumer protocol, uh, consumer group protocol works is that you might have um, one consumer. So in this case, all partitions will be uh, accessible by this, uh, this consumer. If you have a two consumers, so they will split the load. So one consumer will get two partitions, another consumer will get another two partitions. And uh, in this case, they will split this load and uh, you will not get same information twice. So you basically will have this um, like split. If you have a three consumers, so in this case, you will have one consumer will have one partition, another consumer will have one partition, and third consumer will have two partitions. Uh, who can tell me what's going to happen if I have a, in this particular topology, have a five consumers? So it again? In what change what? So how many how many partitions uh, will be allocated for a particular consumer? But I have only four, four. No, four. One, two, three, four. You can have more than one consumer. This is not precisely accurate. You can have, but they will do nothing. They will just starve and sitting there doing nothing. So it's like uh, there's no no work for this consumer. So this is very important property that you need to remember that. Uh, only one consumer, there's like a one to many, uh, the, the ratio between consumer and number of partitions. So this is, this is very powerful actually, that allows to, by defining a number of um, the, the partitions in topic, allows you to define your level of uh, like scalability basically. There's a very good article that you know, digs deeper into the overall uh, how to choose the correct number of partition. But for the, yes? Uh, can partitions be chained in a running system? Yes. Short answer is yes, but there's some nuances. Um, so for, for the sake of this presentation, just uh, stick with this idea that uh, the number of partitions will dictate how you will scale your, scale your application. Um, Kafka streams also uh, have um, mm, the, the, the model how everything will be processing. And um, we have this concept of task that will be executing instance of this topology. So remember, we talk, uh, we talk about this. This is what will be executed. This is, uh, this is topology. So your message will traverse through all the nodes of this topology. And the task will actually will run instance of this topology. And because we have uh, four partitions in the topic, we will start with four tasks in this case. Um, so these tasks are not threads. So it's uh, like think about this, some, some internal green thread type of thing. So that we, we have this like internal task, uh, task manager that will be responsible for running this. But each task will, assi will be assigned to a particular partition and uh, each task will execute its own uh, the uh, instance of topology. So the messages for particular key, they will be placed in particular topic, uh, in particular partition, and after that, this message will be directed to individual task. And this is where you can also find the similarities with databases, uh, because uh, Kafka um, producer and consumer, that is kind of like underlying mechanism for Kafka streams, um, they use uh, the thing called consistent hashing uh, algorithm that allows to, based on the key of your message, figure out which partition will hold this, uh, this particular message. It also have a very interesting property because uh, if you have a message with the same key, they will end up on the same partition. If they end up on the same partition, you will have uh, guarantees of ordering. So the same way how they were uh, populated, they will end up on the same partition and with the same order. Um, it's very important because, okay, so when I, every time when I talk about this thing, if I will make a reference to credit card, so people start getting attention. 
So try, you, you're writing an application that captures some credit card transactions. And the order how your credit card uh, transactions were placed in Kafka topic is important, right? So in this case, if your uh, credit card number will be your uh, key of your message, all transactions will end up in the partition in the order how they were executed. Somehow, when I'm talking about money, people you know, start paying mm -hmm. attention. Um, so in this particular case, we will have four tasks um, that will run with four partitions. Now, the, we can run this as an instance of one application on one node, or we can run this on the four nodes. Um, and uh, the way how it's configured, this can be, you know, there's different trade-offs, but it really uh, something that you need to remember. We have a task per partition period. A result uh, also important. Uh, because this task needs to be accumulated some, somewhere, um, it's required that your result topic should have the same number of partitions as your source topic. So in this case, when you're creating this topic, is something that you need to keep in mind. Um, and some of, the, uh, some of the processor nodes of your topology might have a state. Now, we go into the very uh, now <coughs> interesting, inter interesting world of, uh, of state. Now, how are we going to be uh, scaling our app? So we'll start with one instance. There is no state. Um, we start getting messages. We start running our task. And we start running our topology. Some of the operations on this topology will require the store results from the past. So we will have a state, right? Now, this is how it, how it works. When we add a new instance of application, so what happens? So Kafka uh, consumer protocol also have this uh, concept of rebalance. So imagine, imagine uh, mommy bird feeding uh, worms to baby birds. We have one baby bird, and all four worms, stream of worms, uh, went to one baby bird. Second baby bird hatched. So, mommy bird needs to stop to, per, to, uh, to feeding one uh, baby bird with these birds. And after that, rebalance this partition among these two. Same thing that happens with Kafka when you're adding new consumer and consumer group or any new instance of your Kafka Streams application. Um, the, uh, on the broker side, there is a component called um, the consumer group controller that will be responsible to redistributing this uh, partition. So now, after a new application started, this rebalance happened, and now some of the uh, partitions were assigned to another application instance. Now, in this case, we're also starting from scratch because there was no state here, right? It's, it's a fresh application, there's nothing here. So we need to also uh, recreate state on another node. Um, so it, it as actually happens through the Kafka. Kafka has ability to um, replicate the local state. Kafka streams have ability to replicate local state and store it in a special topic called changelog. We're gonna be talking about changelog topic in a minute. Now, when we want to scale it, we're adding in other instance, we uh, start the topology in uh, instance number three, and we also need to recreate state. But interesting thing, we're not removing state previously available from the first node. And this done uh, in order to perform some of the optimizations in case of some of the applications will go down. And updating local state from this instance would be faster than creating the state from the very beginning. So in this case, scale application and providing full tolerance capabilities, it's the kind of like a part of the same game, part of the same, uh, uh, same coin. So um, full tolerance, like, and we were going back. So we go into the, another direction. One of the nodes uh, failed. So after that, there would be new uh, command to rebalance this partition. So the mommy bird uh, would stop and after that rebalance this it will reassign some of the, um, some of the <coughs> tasks to, between the rest of the application. And as you can see here, some of the state that was previously available now can be also reused. So in this case, we also just rehydrate the things that were produced there, and will be sent there, and vice versa. Any questions so far? Yep. Can you get the state off of the machine? 
Yes. Uh, it, it happens automatically through, it's, it does replication through Kafka, there's a special topic called changelog that captures this state from the machine that failed. I will, uh, I will show you, I'll show you in a moment. So this is um, how it happens. There's a special topic called changelog topic, and changelog topic will capture changes that happen on this database, like small, small database. We're changing this, uh, capturing these changes and populate these changes to this change log talk. So in this case, uh, it has capability to have a local state plus state is also replicated. Okay? So, I, I, I thought you said the events were immutable. Did correct. I, did I misunderstand? No, events are immutable. Immutable. So they're all safe. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. It just strikes me as odd that you have a change log because normally we have a change log and we have only one thing, and it, it actually gets changed. It's mm -hmm. not in the, so the change log here, the change log here is uh, the purpose of the change log is to replicate this new state. So we have some some sort of state. We have a like a key value pair here, right? But we also can capture how this state were changed. For example, um, like my current state, Victor is in Portland. So this is my state. This is this is what so, I'm doing. So it's not a log of the changes. Stop. Just just bear with me for one second, and I will uh, you will understand the, what's the um, what's the difference between state and uh, this like log what we're trying to. Do. So like I have this app that uh, called um, Swarm, like for Foursquare basically, that where I can go and I can check in places. So it will collect events of my travel. But for you, you don't really care about all events that happened during my travel. You care about that I'm here, it's my current state. So this is what happens over here. Your application receives the message, you start doing some processing, you start doing count. You need to count how many times uh, Victor checked in the Starbucks. So in this case, this application will have you Victor as a key and value five, okay? You don't care about history, but we also care about things if this application will die. So we need to somehow replicate this. So every time when you're updating, you're changing state from four to five, we actually underline, generate another event that goes into change log topic that will create history of your local states. In this case, it allows us to reconstruct the state in another instance in case we fail. So Kafka is ultimate storage for everything that we do, including data that you're collecting there, like you have a stream of uh, stocks from the stock exchange. Also, it also use Kafka to store information from your processing nodes, if you do uh, stateful stream processing. Does make sense at all? For the uh, change log events, is only order stored, or you also store a time stamp? Um, so the message itself uh, have a lot of things. It has a key value, it has timestamp, it has an offset. So basically, when we have the storage, um, uh, it's basically append only file. So we're always writing to the end of the file. In order to know where this message in file, we need to know offset. Basically, if you ever write this like a Java application which have a log4j there, and we do every time you do whatever debug or info, you know, in particular line, you have one record that represents state of your application. Mm -hmm. So same thing here. So you can have a timestamp, you can have offset, which is basically a line in the file, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, have this message, and so forth and so on. So um, let me get back to um, change log talk. So once again, uh, this is, this is uh, very important to understand that it's nothing new here because every database that you have your Oracle, the, the, this is how it works. Every time when you do insert to table, it's actually create a record in the transaction log of your Oracle. And only after that, it will be materialized as the state of this, as your table. So the same idea taken here, but like multiplied and used in, in, uh, in, many, in many aspects. So this is your input data. Input data doesn't change. We, we're, not, we're not modifying this in place. These messages go through topology to result topic. And uh, in result topic, all this uh, result information also immutable. So you're not changing this anything there. 
you will just adding new data into the topic, right? And this process is constant. So you're not starting this application just you know to get this um, to get to like one step. This application is constantly running. This is what's the difference between kind of um, you you need to like react on some message or like you need to wake up, execute something, and after that go to sleep. So this application is constantly running. And if there's a new message, this message will go through the polygon. Right. So how it works in, uh, in our example with uh, four partitions. So this is how it works. Every task will have uh, its own uh, partition in the change log topic. And if we want to scale this to another node, the, the, we migrate this task to another instance. And uh, this another instance start doing things through the change log topic as well. Uh, it writes the uh, changes from one place to another. So this is pretty much it. Now important is uh, what how how much uh, time we spend to recovering. Like what's the what uh, how much time we will get when we are recovering from from failures. How we can uh, how fast we can rehydrate um, from the Kafka change log topic. So interesting aspect. So we have uh, two types of topics. One is a topic that have full history, all events from the beginning of time. And we have the, the, the topic that we call compacted topic. But do not be confused with uh, compressed, because it's two different things. So compacted topic is actually a topic that only contains the latest and greatest value for a particular key. So essentially, we use this compacted topic as a, as a state store. So because you don't care about history, you only care about latest and greatest value. So all change log topics are compacted. So in this case, you don't need to, uh, if you need to recover state, you don't need to read this topic from the very beginning. Because in this topic, you always have a state. You just uh, stream it back from the instance of your application that doesn't have it. Um, and uh, the size of this topic, the for change log topic, will be uh, linearly grow, depends on of your size. So there's a different mechanism um, that allows you to configure this, uh, the compaction mechanism. The compaction mechanism that happens on the broker side of things. And this broker, uh, there's like special thread that can run some, sometimes you can configure it. So, if you have a large state to recover, it will take time to recover. So this is something that needs to keep in mind and uh, some of the things that I will explain. So this is like change log topic. Internally, when I said the topic represents a file, it's actually a set of files. And uh, also in order to like perform access to this file more efficiently, uh, it actually split, this uh, partition is split into segments. <laughs> Compaction happens uh, only in on inactive segments. So um, there is a mechanism of kind of like a rolling over segments when this group, like <laughs> for example, segment size one gigabyte. And in this case, when this segment will be more than one gigabyte, we will just roll over to another file. So after that, we will mark this segment as inactive. And after that, the compactor can actually execute the job and remove all uh, history and just have a latest and greatest. So this is something that happens on the broker side. So this is something is, is um, probably as a developer, you don't need to you know, think uh, much because usually like a dev cop cops, people are responsible for uh, dealing with this kind of thing. But this is important to know in order to say, okay, Victor, my application startup is slow. Why is that? So this is why you need to know this. Now, uh, this is before compaction, after compaction. As you can see, some of the segments were cleaned up and uh, some of the segments still uh, still available. Sometimes people can say, okay, I have a topic, a uh, compacted topic, but I still have a few, uh, not the only one record, but some of the few. It's just because you're trying to read this topic from the very beginning. Probably you're also reading from the, um, the inactive segments because like when you start reading from the beginning you don't really care about like current offset um, so 
this is this is also um, important for recovery of the application. If you have a like big state, if you have a lot of objects and you do, for example, big windows, this is, this is also important. If you're trying to do calculation for like 24 hours or or a week, you can have this window. It's okay, but you need to remember the state uh, of your computation uh, will be uh, will be big. Um, so there is a certain uh, overhead and uh, different uh, configuration wise. Uh, so for example, when we start the segment size with one gigabyte, so in this case, the, the, the time to compact this topic and or to start compacting this topic will be a uh, large, more, more, it will take more time until the actual compaction will kick in. Um, so this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of normal thing in, in the Kafka world. Uh, but this is something that you need to know. Like, if you're trying to do like a really big windows, or your messages are really big, and like like each individual message might be stored like, up to like 10, 20 times. Now, the um, recovery overhead is uh, proportional to uh, the segment size. It's configured on the broker side, and you can also configure this. Um, I guess you can configure this even per topic. So when you're creating a topic, you can define the, the segment size or something that you need. Um, the, uh, if you have a smaller state, obviously recovery will be faster. Uh, if you, uh, you the, usually these change log topics are created automatically uh, by, by framework with certain defaults, but uh, it will either inherit some of the configuration from the input topics, and after that, we'll do the same configuration to create this uh, transient topic. But also, you can also create these topics uh, uh, manually, so you can, can configure this kind. Uh, this is the topic configuration, uh, size of segment and bytes, and uh, the log cleaner, this process that we'll be running, you can configure to kick in uh, this very often or maybe not often. It really depends on you know how much storage you have, how many nodes you have, and other things. Uh, you can ask me, okay, so how we can get this like ideal value? Uh, there is no ideal value. You you just need to you know experiment with the size of your data and see like always measure constantly measure because um, if you cannot measure something, you cannot control. So in this case, it's just a, a different use cases might have a different approach. Now when you now your your heads are totally blown. Okay, we good. We still good. Okay, so let's let's switch our gears. Yes, please. Is there just one change log topic, or is there as many change log topics as the input topic? Um, change log topics is uh, created per store that you create within processor. So in this particular case, in my small application, my I have just only one place where I'm aggregating this. If in your topology you have multiple places where you aggregate, you do like uh, counts, you do like averages and, and things like that, you will need to have a store. So for each store will be, uh, the change log topic will be created. Um, you will see there's some, like uh, uh, if you will list the topic in Kafka, you will see distinct name for, for certain things. You will see, um, if, if you're using this, uh, the, the Fluent uh, API, this name will be generated and you will understand it would be something like, um, I, I will show you in them. Now, Kubernetes, 2014, we start uh, solving problems of models with microservices. 2016, we start solving problems with microservices with Docker. 2018, we start solving problems with Docker with Kubernetes. All right, so what's going to be next? Um, so the important thing that the Kubernetes is also known as the system for orchestration uh, that provides you uh, with resources for compute, for uh, for storage, for server discovery, blah blah blah. But essentially, it's something that you go and tell. I need to run this application. I need this disk. I need this memory. Do it. And this is essentially my take to Kubernetes. It's just a modern distributed operating system. It's a, right now. It's still uh, quite uh, low level. Uh, we still need to do. Uh, and think about things like a pod, um, the per persistent volumes, and things like that. Same way as you, you if you ever wrote uh, like system applications, any like uh, application that will be you know, running in your in your operating system, uh, like uh, 
DLL or something like that. Uh, you need to think about you know these kind of resources, but uh, hopefully it will be changing very very soon. And everyone like major vendor now have its own uh, distribution of Kubernetes. Which also reminds me the Linux wars when the every everyone releasing their own version of Linux. Uh, from perspective of developers, uh, Kubernetes it's uh, it's API server. It has API that uh, talks uh, the, the, uh, to your your client in this particular case, Kube Control, it's a command line tool that talks to this API server. You can also do this programmatically. There is API for different languages that in Java and, and Go and other languages you can talk to Kubernetes uh, programmatically. Um, the concept of pod is the way how they uh, talking about like a minimum deployable thing, right? So pod is the number, the set, set, of, um, um, set of containers. Uh, these containers, you can have a one container per pod or you can have a two containers per pod. I'm not gonna cover this, why you need to do this. Um, you can ask me, <laughs> but um, it's, it's still like, uh, I'll try to save some time. Now, uh, these containers can share some of, the, um, some of the resources. For example, if there's two containers running within uh, one pod, they share local hosts, so they don't need to go through the discovery uh, mechanism to, to figure out like what, where, where's, the, where's the other container. Um, storage, um, the Kubernetes provides a way that um, you can request uh, storage. There is a persistent volume, this is how you define where this data will be stored. And there's concept of persistent volume claims, it's just your kind of like a ticket. You want to say, oh, I just want to have one uh, gigabyte of data, just give it to me. Um, and after that, you just mount this to your pod and uh, it will materialize this some of the, you know, file system, mounted file system in your, in your, in your, um, in your container. Um, you, yeah, using position volume claims. Cool. Now, to run stateful workloads, uh, there is a concept of stateful sets that allows you to have a stateful network identity that allows you to address a particular pod with stateful network identity, uh, like uh, my pod dash zero, my pod dash two, my pod dash three. Um, on the contrary, this, like when you deploy something, you will see some of the random generative name like uh, my pod something and blah 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 in uh, F one A four. So, um, same thing for um, um, for disks. So when one of the pods will be scheduled and this pod will fail, the Kubernetes will be responsible to reschedule this pod on another node. But if you run this in a stateful set, it will attach to this pod, attach the same storage. It's also important in our perspective because our applications can be stateful. All right. Um, so now, how Kafka Streams is related to the uh, to this thing? Now we have uh, our application. We have a store that will be stored in file system of this application. So there is ability, or like there is a like trade off that we can take. So first of all, we don't really care about this local store. You learn that this this state is uh, replicated anyways, right? And you can say, okay, I will have uh, my state uh, small enough, like my windows, uh, when I will be calculating this, small enough that my application startup will not take a long time. So I don't really need to care about you know, how I will deploy this stuff. Um, I don't need to have a disk there because everything will be stored in Kafka. Because Victor said Kafka is awesome and you know, the things will be there for, for a very long time. Um, so, in this particular case, like you say, the stateful set is very complicated, we're not going to be using because you need to deal with the state. But, if you have application that will benefit from restoring the state from, it's actually totally tweetable because, you know, because of the, uh, the pictures and stuff, people love this stuff in the internet. Um, if you want to recover your application, you probably want to benefit from the previous knowledge that you already calculated. Um, but if you think that your application is just, just doing, um, maybe you're just doing like a state, uh, stateless processing. You just do filtering, something like that, right? You don't really care about the state. So in this case, you do scale out, scale, um, scale out, uh, or uh, scale out and scale in, right? So you can um, downsizing. Uh, or you just simply don't trust your uh, system and they say that uh, manages your, your storage. So there's two options. 
And um, so let's um, let's see these two options how they will work. So basically, you need to keep uh, the change logs sm uh, small. Small. Um, so in this case, you can use this configuration that I already covered. The um, uh, if you trust your storage and your system administrator, use stateful sets. So in this case, the Kubernetes will be responsible for bringing correct storage back to your application when this application will recover. Um, this is a cool thing uh, called uh, anti-affinity. So when you're deploying something into Kubernetes, you can actually provide certain... Um, uh, you, you can say, okay, just deploy whatever, whenever, and I don't care. But sometimes you can say, I really care about the things, and I don't want you to deploy to my applications, to my Kafka Streams instances on the same node from Kubernetes node pool. So you can, in this case, you can define uh, the anti-affinity policy. In this case, Kubernetes will not place them on the same node. So they will be running on different nodes. So in case of failure of individual physical or virtual node, um, it's... It's really difficult to say, uh, in 2019, it's really difficult to say about um, physical nodes anymore because you don't know what you're running. Because like my, my, my Kubernetes cluster runs in, in Google Cloud. In Google Cloud, it runs on top of, they have a certain the, uh, node that configured uh, a certain type of nodes. But it's actually not virtual. It's not virtual, it's not physical because Google Cloud itself runs on top of Borg that runs on top of some of the like highly scalable hardware, which is, you know, you start thinking about this, you can go crazy. What's the level of virtualization we have here? Um, so, but yeah, if we return to our question, anti-affinity rules allow you to specify how you can schedule this application and whatnot. Um, uh, use uh, the parallel uh, pod management. So this is, um, by default, when you deploy multiple replicas in your Kubernetes, Kubernetes will do this one by one. So it will deploy first one, and after that it wait until uh, the uh, readiness uh, probe will be re uh, return whatever correct result, and after that we'll start uh, deploying another replica. So in this particular case, we can speed up application startup when we need to scale up our application. We uh, we can define the um, the the pod management is parallel, so you, a few applications will start in parallel. And uh, the Kafka, Kafka Streams, they also have uh, some of the optimizations in order to reduce time for this like rebalance. When you join or you leave a, a consumer group, it will take some time to rebalance this partition. So Kafka Streams have, uh, has uh, certain optimizations. Um, so this is how deployment looks like. This deployment is the, uh, the way how you can tell Kubernetes how to deploy your stuff. Uh, essentially, this is what you define here. You're saying, okay, I'm starting with one replica, I can go with two replicas. Uh, and this is how you define your anti-affinity rule, right? You can specify that um, the, the in Kubernetes, there is a concept of uh, labels. You can uh, label certain pods with certain <coughs> label. So in this case, if these, um, the the label selector will return some of the label, uh, some of the pods that label of this like app uh, thing that includes my stream stock stats uh, name. So in this case, it will not place it on the same host. Um, and obviously, like you are deploying your uh, container application here. For stateful set, uh, this stuff looks a little bit different because um, you uh, you defining some of the persistent volume claims. So you can uh, you can claim this uh, the rocks DB thing uh, with size of one GB, and after that, inside your container, you actually map this to um, to it's it's, it's it's a standard directory, but you can change this uh, in configuration. This is a standard directory that um, Kafka streams uh, use to store your local state um, on particular node. All right. Let's see if uh, internet is uh, uh, is good here, so we can do some some of, some of the stuff. So oh, um, so where is it? Uh, okay. Um, so first of all, let's see if we have uh, have a connections. Um, we do have. Let me open this window. This is my uh, get uh, pods. So this is uh, uh, my Kubernetes cluster is deployed in uh, Google Cloud Platform, and um, the there's nothing here 
get a node. Um, it runs uh, with two nodes. So in this particular case, I want to show you that um, how I well scale my scale my application, uh, my uh, Kafka Streams application that will be uh, the run this uh, computation. So let's start with this simple deployment. Um, so this is how. Let me show you once again. This is how my deployment looks like from perspective of YAML. How many of you guys and ladies uh, love YAML? Anyone? <laughs> Have you heard that um, um, there's going to be new stuff in some of the tools? For example, Helm will introduce Lua scripting for deployment. How many of you excited about Lua? I just want to see how, how Java developers are excited about, um, about Lua. Not so much, right? Uh, how many of you guys seen there's a uh, the Kotlin DSL for Kubernetes? What? Kotlin. Kotlin DSL. You can write your you know your apps in cool new language, which also compiles down to the things that you know, the bytecode and stuff. And you still can do your things with Kubernetes and stuff. Um, probably the next thing I will just add the Kotlin DSL to mix to to make this uh, the demo even cooler. Now. So uh, my application is uh, is compiled and deployed into uh, the container registry that uh, is in the Google Cloud. In uh, in this application, I use pretty cool plugin for Maven that allows me to not think about any tools installed. So it's called uh, Jeb, I guess. Um, this is a tool also from Google that allows you to like if you need to build your images and uh, you know, publish it somewhere. You don't need to have a Docker tools installed because you know, just use this Maven uh, plugin that will allow you to do that. So in this case, it will compile my application, produces the Uber jar that will have uh, uh, all dependencies, my Kafka streams dependencies, some of the other stuff that I want to have. For example, I want to have uh, the library for parsing JSON because my payload will be in JSON and things like that. So my Uber jar will be packaged in the image and after that published into uh, Google, uh, in the Google uh, Cloud Platform. Now, so let's, uh, let's deploy this guy. So uh, let's deploy. So deployment created. If I'll do uh, get pods, so I'll see some pods, if pod is up and running. So let me do uh, watch so I can see how we can create the pods. Now, uh, in order to uh, show you that something is up and running, so first of all, I want to use some of the components of the Confluent platform that we use um, um, into, in order to like monitor stuff and things like that. I have this guy called uh, Control Center. So just let me run it. Uh, control Center. Okay. And... Um, after that, I need to uh, have a load generator for my app. Um, it's uh, oh. so with my uh, um, I need to run. So my application actually have a two two pieces. One produces some of the um, yes the the stock producer. Uh, it will just generate some of the random stocks and place into the topic. Um, here I can do consume that allows me to um, to read output so I see that my application is, is working and uh, data is uh, is flows through so so now we have application deployed here this is uh, my Kubernetes thing uh, application is up and running my uh, the load generator generates load and some of the computation happened here so you can see um, it collects the uh, the, every five seconds, it will just you know, spin the result here because the window uh, window time is like five seconds <coughs> by one second. Um, now, so let's uh, let's scale this. Uh, in order to to show you why it is important, let me see if my control center is up and running. Uh, all right, so control center is up and running. So control center is just a, a tool that you can use for development. It's like available for uh, one uh, one node for free. Um, so it's um, first of all my my topics. 
So it has, uh, I have uh, two topics. One topic will have a uh, data where my data generator will produce something here. Uh, and this is output. So uh, in order to see what is, what is going on here, I can also inspect the topic and see if the new messages will throw, flow through. Um, um, to answer your question about the timestamp, this is how the message, this is the message format. You have uh, information about the topic, in what topic the data goes, what partition, uh, offset information. So all this information here, uh, there is a timestamp, there is a um, timestamp type because the Kafka streams as a framework allows you to have a different, um, um, how it's called. Um, so you, 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 can, you can deal with different the processing time. You can depend on uh, you know, how you will extract this timestamp if it's a creation of event time or um, the, the time where this, let me, let me, let me start, start over. So there's a thing called processing time and event time. Um, and uh, to give you example, how the processing time depends on the event time, uh, how many of you guys uh, have and ladies, we have uh, the Star Wars fans here. So if we're talking about the Star Wars uh, timeline, so we have episode 4, episode 5, episode 6. And after that, we have episode 2, episode 3. Episode yeah. 1 doesn't exist, right? <laughs> How many of you heard about Machete Order? So there's... thing. Okay. You, you, will get the, you will get some prize from me. Um, so essentially, this is the right order of uh, watching the Star Wars. So you're watching this uh, episode four, episode five. After that, you're watching episode two, episode three, and after that, you're watching episode uh, six. Uh, and in Machine Order, episode one does the. Um, so this is um, when we're dealing with these uh, the episodes in the Star Wars universe. We have a from episode one like continuation. This is our. Um, the event time. This is how the things are happened, like natural order. But the way how we get this from George Lucas and team is our processing time. So our processing time is episode four, five, six, one, two, three, right? So this is the difference. And with the Kafka streams, based on the like APIs, you can you can you can choose if you will extract this message for, uh, from like a creation of time, or you can have some additional uh, metadata that inside your message that you can extract and use this to build this window, how you will calculate stuff. Now, and uh, another topic here is the output. This is where we're writing this result. And now there's one interesting topic that's called um, aggregate change log. I don't remember who asked this question. Um, I believe it was you. You were asking like how many uh, change log topics you have. So because my application because my application here, um, the uh, this one, it has just one place where I'm saying materialized. Let me disable this. Can I do this? No. Um, I I have this name of the store trade aggregate. So each instance of application will have this um, uh, this small database. And now this is. Uh, my application ID, stocks2, and uh, my trade aggregates, name of my store, and after the change log that defines the change log. This is the naming. Now, so uh, in order to see how the introduction of new, new message details here. So now, remember, when I start with these tasks, I showed you that uh, each task will execute um, the its own instance of topology. As you can see, I have a three consumers in the consumer group. In this case, it's going to be it, this, this two, two um, these three consumers that run within one application. For each partition that I have in my stocks partition, I have an instance that listens this message per partition. Now, and also here, I have this concept of um, the consumer like, meaning how far my consumer from the top of uh, the topic of the data. So as you can see here, my consumer currently is 173 messages behind because, because of, I don't know, like small consumption. And this is normal situation. Kafka able to, um, to, to hold these messages for the time being that you will be you know, able to catch up. So in order to 
in order to uh, scale this, scale this application, so what I will do here, let me bigger, um, I'll do something like, um, so first of all, let me show you, uh, let me show you deployment. Um, deploy, uh, the deployment, and we say, get deployment, and uh, I can do subscribe. So this is uh, this is our deployment of our application, and uh, this is uh, lots of interesting thing. But only thing that we're interesting here is actually where is this uh, replication vector uh, replicas? Yeah. So I say I want uh, just one replica, so it's fine here. How I will scale this? Um, um, so don't do this in production. But um, <laughs> essentially, this is what you do. You go in here, say two. That boom, you have a uh, deployed another application. Mm -hmm. This is how you do it. And the Kubernetes is quite powerful to do this kind of stuff, right? Um, why I uh, why I tell you not do is production because you know it's difficult to track and figure out the uh, if you're doing things like that. There's no like change management. Um, you don't know what kind of release deployed, what kind of version of this code. It's good for demo and you know to look cool and things like that. But do not do this in production because you need to follow like change management procedures. Because often uh, it's it's good if you have a kind of like a DevOps culture and organization. So you talk to people who support your application. But in many cases, when I saw the past, like people just throw and literally code over the fence, and after that the operations people don't know what to do. So don't uh, or if you're doing this kind of tricks just you know document them now let's take a look at what we see here so we go in consumer lag this is our consumer group um we see details we don't see actually that something like uh, radically change here um because we just have a uh, consumer ids but essentially right now we have a uh, two applications running one application will have one consumer and another application have two consumers right now so I want to show you another cool thing. Remember I was talking about these uh, anti-affinity rules, right? So how can I do things like um, three? Can I? Any uh, takers? What's gonna happen? So this is something that is specifically related to, to Kubernetes. So I have my cluster of two nodes. I have only two nodes in my node pool. And I have an anti-affinity rule that says that pod needs to be scheduled, only one pod needs to be scheduled on one node, right? So in this case, this pod will not be, uh, will not be scheduled. And if I will run this, because there's no re there are no resources to do that. If I'll do describe once again, um, you will see that three desire but only two available, one unavailable. Yeah. I'm just so I'm not understanding this correctly. Um, these Kubernetes pods, which have multiple containers, is Kafka's broker service running inside each pod? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't say anything about broker. I have a slide for that. Just hold your. <laughs> is that running inside Kubernetes? Right? Well, technically, it runs inside Kubernetes, but inside different Kubernetes cluster in a different place. That. I will, I will, I will show. I have a slide for that. I anticipated this one. Um, so how you can solve this? Um, so you solve this by uh, basically scaling your cluster. You do um, you do resize uh, on your uh, Kubernetes. This is a this is tool in a Google Cloud Platform that allows me to scale. I just specify the node. Um, uh, I'll run this. It will ask me if I want to increase it. I say yes. After some time, uh, it will add another node in node pool, and after that, Kubernetes will be able to um, to schedule. Um, while I'm doing this, let's switch to a couple more slides. So the Kafka streams have an ability to to recover some state. Um, it uses Kafka to store the state for change log. Or I didn't show you the stateful set, but I would say this is going to be your, you know, the extra curriculum so you can do it yourself. Uh, you can go grab the code and uh, figure out 
Now, the, the, uh, with Kubernetes, you can easily scale your application. Just go there on my production Kubernetes cluster and just you know, throw more, uh, more nodes there. It's amazing, right? So it's, uh, it's cool, it's, uh, it's, it's agile and things like that. But again, uh, don't do this in production because you need to uh, be responsible for the things that you're doing. Um, and uh, stateful sets for application that require some of the longer time to recover from, from the failures. Now, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, what about Kafka itself? So, the thing what you just saw that um, I'm actually using the Kafka cluster that provisioned in Confluent Cloud, which actually runs inside Kubernetes. We internally use uh, Kubernetes to provision your clusters. And uh, it also brings me to another point that um, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be releasing this thing called the uh, Confluent Operator that allows you to have uh, same thing that we run similar that we have in our in our cloud that runs um, that runs and provisions all the cluster for all our customers there that allows you to automate provisioning of Kafka brokers Kafka cluster um, allows you to scale this up and down if you need to scale this down um, also it provides some of the like and enforces some of the best practices in order to have this like rolling restarts on the Kafka broker and not losing your um, not losing your, your data and stuff like that. Uh, we integrate with the standard tools like Prometheus, plus we're also providing a uh, control center in um, deployment and operator. And it's uh, gonna be like enterprise support for us. Now, this is stuff uh, that you also probably wanna take a picture because um, this is, if you're interested in more Kubernetes things, I recorded a few videos. Uh, we do have uh, some of the, um, if you wanna deploy your Kafka in Kubernetes, uh, there's a Helm chart. Uh, and we have this uh, Slack community, which is, um, uh, we're running the, the, this uh, the, the community in Slack. There's uh, the chat room called Kubernetes, where uh, you can ask the questions and I, I kind of hang out there. And one last thing, uh, let me hold it for you for just one second. Cool. Um, and one last thing that uh, we have this uh, awesome event that coming in New York and after that in London, and after that in San Francisco called Kafka Summit. This is where we, uh, we organize this like, community event as a company. And um, <coughs> it's a place, if you're doing Kafka things, it's a place to be. You know, there we have uh, people from Confluent, people from the cloud there, people from Corp or some other providers of uh, Kafka or whatever things. Uh, we have uh, speakers from the industry, from different organizations that they talk about their uh, journey to Kafka or some of the like, hardcore talks, like I try to deliver hardcore talk um, that uh, goes into deep uh, of the certain framework. So it's a pretty cool event. Um, it's a 30% discount, my personal um, uh, discount. So hopefully you will find this useful. And again, uh, in a couple weeks in New York. Um, and uh, it's also important that if you have an interesting Kafka story to tell, we have a Kafka Summit the San Francisco uh, call for papers offer. So uh, submit your paper, and in this case, you don't need to pay for a ticket because you know if you speak at the Kafka Summit, you will get this ticket for free. All right, thank you so much for your time. Um, as always, I am available for advanced interrogation. Uh, we do have some swag. We're not giving away the swag. We will just give this for good questions. <laughs> thank you so much. And if, if you did tweet during this presentation, I will find you and uh, if you won this ruffle, you also will get this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I saw, I think it was about two weeks ago on the you had they announced Orcus. I have no idea. I have a Kubernetes, Kubernetes um, native framework. Does that sound familiar? It does. I haven't touched it because they announced it this the week when I was in DevNexus. I have a chance to look at this. I don't know what this is. Okay. It's just something that looked interesting as um, for a Kubernetes native framework for deploying. Um, Java applications, and so it looked like they already had like, the integration with Kafka um, described on the website. But Unfortunately, I have yeah, I, I don't have any comments about this because I just simply I haven't I haven't looked at this one, so I don't I don't know. Probably they have something, so uh, most likely. Who asked the question? Yeah, what's the uh, what's the size? Oh, uh, large. All right, so good questions, good prices. <laughs> Don't just leave. Yeah.
how do you recommend um, testing applications like for development? <laughs> Uh, so for yeah, so Kafka Streams, like I said, it, it, it's um, it's a library that has all possible batteries. So there's a testing framework for Kafka Streams that allows you to uh, write this like a test topologies. So you don't need to even have Kafka to test your Kafka Streams application. So there is a like a testing harness that allows you to, like write your unit okay. test. Um, there is a um, there's an embedded Kafka that allows you to run the Kafka in process with your unit test. It's more like integrational test. Another approach is to use the library called test containers that allows you to run um, actual Kafka that runs inside the, some of the like Docker image. And in this case, you just have a more or less integration test. So you, you, you test your application against like real software that will be potentially running your. Yeah, I've, I've written something that spins in a lot uh, locally, like back. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering if there's a better way. No, a uh, better way is to use uh, the, it's called the uh, test topology driver that allows you to not, like, even start Kafka at all. Okay. What's the size? Oh, uh, size is probably uh, small. Small? It's an American apparel. Oh. So they run really small. You're not a small. <laughs> <laughs> I tried one on yesterday. <laughs> Maybe I'm not just I'll trade you for medium. Medium, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> if anybody's actually. I don't see anything. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm new to Kafka. I just want to know what are the key performance aspects for you to take Confluent Cloud. It's the most successful use case. And LinkedIn, obviously, most successful use case. And uh, Netflix, there's like small con company, they do like video things. Um, there's a small company called Uber. Um, they they also quite successful with, you know, people riding on the cars. Uh, there's another company that is doing a similar thing called Lyft. Um, they also quite successful. Uh, we do have some like financial uh, customers that actually it's on our website where like RBC they were talking about their um, use case with Kafka and how they upload their like mainframe workloads using the like a stream approach. So and uh, we have a bunch of videos from Kafka Summit last year in San Francisco. We had this like a business track, like a use cases track. The people from Uber, people from Apple were talking there. So. I don't know <laughs> if it was enough uh, success stories with Kafka. Any or... revival technology? Say it again. A re a revival. I don't know. <laughs> it's like it, it's it, it's it, it's good to be in the Kafka world because everyone's using Kafka and Kafka is ones. a de facto standard for yeah. distributed functions. Okay. I mean, competing with the RabbitMQ, WebStreamQ, but that's like school. SQS. <laughs> yes. What sort of uh, process do you use for debugging something difficult to track? Yeah, so if you are talking about specifically uh, how to debugging your um, the Kafka Streams application, or you're talking about in general how you can do like a global kind of like a where is the thing you go wrong? I guess more than one. Uh, usually, the things around the uh, um, distributed tracing. This is something that you need to look if you want to have this kind of full end-to-end -end view to the things. Um, the we, a friend of mine, uh, he he built uh, some of the. Um, there's a there's a library called um, Open Tracing, and there's integration for some of the Kafka clients. So you can see how the message through flow through things on if you're using like Jaeger, which is kind of like a dashboard that um, open tracing support. Um, the, how you can debug. So the control center provides some like a um, valuable metrics that you need to monitor for for broker like what's the number of partition like up and running. There's plenty of tools that allows you to kind of like a monitor and see what's going on. There's like a, the open source Kafka manager. That allows you also visualize what's 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 going on there, but um, yeah, I mean it's it's just a matter of what kind of tools you're using for this kind of task. Um, there are tools, and there's like huge uh, ecosystem of the things people doing for for Kafka. Um, so it's 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 pretty kind of like a 
wave answer. Um, so we work on some tools that allows people to, you know, see what's going on in, in details. But uh, as always, you can do, uh, you know, profile your application because it's a Java application and all the tools are also working. <coughs> Excel. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I was just kind of curious. Like, I have no concept or context for this. Mm -hmm. I'm wanting to learn more. Uh, what What do you need to consider or think about in terms of? So there are things you need to consider in terms of security. Here is um, how you would protect your data in motion because it's a network system, uh, and how you protect data at rest because it's also uh, system that has persistency. Uh, we have a, the, the Kafka supports um, the secure the channel, so you can use like a TLS to encrypt the channel that your clients communicate. Um, we support ACLs, access control list that you can if you run Kafka and it's like a shared environment, multiple applications use the same instance. You don't want you don't want them to access like a topics of someone else. Uh, we have this ACLs uh, uh, that allows you to control this. For um, for things like uh, access control, we have integration with like enterprise system like a Kerberos and like Active Directory. It's built in. Um, if you need to do things around encryption of the storage, uh, our story here is not uh, that excited because it really depends on uh, different organization. They standardize on different tools for encryption. Um, most of the people tend to use uh, like standard like Linux encryption, Lux. Um, there's some like hardware-based encryption technologies, but basically whatever is allowed you to to encrypt your disk, Kafka will work. Um, it's just a matter of like uh, how important your data versus how fast you want to be. Because right, you know once right. you start introducing encryption type of thing, um, we rely on like standard libraries from Java and uh, for you know encryption in motion. So when 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 you use like TLS and things like that. We're getting huge um, performance boost with like up just simply upgrading JVM. Like JVM, okay. uh, Java 11 has uh, a huge improvements in overall uh, like encryption mechanism and like uh, all this TLS thing uh, become faster. So cool. this is kind of like we have a pretty good story around this. And if you want to learn more, again in the Kafka Summit from the previous years, we have some videos where the, the companies like Apple they're talking about like security, like at large. How are they doing this in, in, in their music? Thank you. Yes. Uh, so when you're like technology, uh, technology diagram, it's sort of with a straight line. Is, yeah. is there different shapes of technology as well? Awesome question. So um, this is kind of um, the um, I took this uh, the Kafka streams actually that allows me to uh, Kafka streams allows me to output this topology so I can use this tool to visualize it. So it, it doesn't answer directly to your question, but still you see there's some branches. So in this particular case, this is the topology where I have a like very straight line, but you can have multiple, um, so you can use one stream as a source to multiple uh, sub topologies. But only thing that you need to keep in mind, there's, should, there, there, there could be no uh, like uh, cycles because it's a DAG, because it's a, direct, it's a directed and a cycl uh, a cyclic. Um, and, uh, this is like pretty much it. So we have a topology where you, you you perform all this calculation, and there's some you know some store where you store it. So with these, um, the there's two flavors of API in Kafka streams. One is uh, like a fluent that looks like a Java eight, um, Java eight Java util streams API. Uh, there's also processor API that allows you to build this topology you know by connecting sources, sinks, and processors manually. So in this case, it's quite rich. You can build. Is that kind of like how the architecture is there? Uh, I don't know, but uh, the all technologies that do stream processing, they still they have the similar concept of some sort of like a notion of DAG in it. So I I believe it's going to be like similar because. This is how uh, the Spark does things. It has like Hazelcast Jam. The um, uh, maybe even uh, Aqua Streams also does. So related to that, um, does it like there, there's nothing explicitly preventing it from 
being safe, right? Like you could have something. You will not be able because the framework will validate. Right. So if you have, a, for example, one one node will have like multiple, you know, you try to introduce so a like cycle. A string processor um, output to a, a different topic that's kind of string. Topology, yeah, right? but it's nothing to do with topology itself. You cannot have a DAG in topology, but if you want to have a topic that writes in one topic and reads from the same topic, you can introduce this, but it's nothing to do with the uh, the, the cycles inside topology of the app. Okay. It's just, you know, you, you happen to use the same topic for uh, for multiple things, but it doesn't do anything good. Just, you know, if you want to break things, you will. But <laughs> framework itself, when you're building this topology, will not allow you to introduce nodes. That will have a cycle. Does he get a cycle? I just want one of those stickers. Uh, yeah, stickers. You don't need to do anything for stickers. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just kind of a basic question. Um, I don't really understand it. But if I wanted to process XML, JSON, CSV, and data form, how do I actually represent that at the beginning? Um, in um, in my app, like all my data is JSON. So if you look, uh, if we look here, this is JSON. So if I can represent this somehow in Java, so I can do processing. This is just an app. It's nothing more. It's not a cluster or nothing. It's just an app that runs this library. And this library is a Java library. So in this case. If we have a, a like XML uh, parser that works in this app, and there's there's small things that you need to take into account, like the size of the message. If you have a, like a couple of megabytes XML that go in through Kafka pipe, maybe it's another good idea to do these kind of things. You can probably can say, okay, got some landing area where you place this XML, and after you use on this identification. But this is topical for different uh, kind of discussion. But uh, short answer is yes, you can. We still have a few few shirts. All right. Asking once, twice. Okay. Okay. Not about kinesis. So you, you were talking about uh, some lack of uh, processor. So does it mean that cannot like rely on when I decide to build some like real time application? There could be situation when uh, my processing is far from the source of the event or and so uh, if you can if you can bring things into Kafka uh, so it's like you can use Kafka streams to do processing after uh, whatever you're doing before the event in, in Kafka it's not you know business of Kafka uh, it's maybe you know you need to have a connector that will bring this data in uh, but the connector is not Maybe, like maybe I'm rephrasing my question. So yeah. We were building a system for uh, for monitor events uh, between microservices. Yeah. And we get into the situation, uh, well, we, we didn't use a Kafka with different uh, tools, <laughs> other tools. So it was a situation where then uh, when we had a, a lot of events produced mm -hmm. and our consumers were, were like 10 minutes behind of mm -hmm. produce, uh, consume those events. Mm -hmm. So we cannot build like a real time tool. So do we have some, I don't know, some best practices how to how to handle such situations? Yeah. Like yeah. So the thing what I just uh, what I was talking about, like when you have a multiple instances of your application, you basically you scaling your reads. So in this case, you increasing the speed of processing of your data. Um, there was situation in my in my code, for example, in my in my demo where I have this like, consumer lag and I was like 200 minutes behind, right? But it was done like specifically in order to show you that like I have only one instance and it's like it was specifically done it runs on some uh, very slow uh, VM uh, to demonstrate that like you just if you're introducing new uh, instances uh, of the application you just scale in reads and processing of your application so uh, the short answer here you just like having more instances of your application you will uh, speed up the processing thing there's different uh, for, for Kafka matter there's different optimizations that you can do uh, like you might have uh, bigger buffers or like on on the 
on the side of consumer so you will get bigger chunks of messages rather than getting individual messages all the time so in this case you can save some of the network trip uh, when this uh, consumer reads the data you can have a uh, different uh, you can always like scale your processor on the, on the consumer side and the cool thing about Kafka it's not it's not push system consumer only reads when it's ready to read uh, there's also ability to do some like asynchronous uh, so you read the message and after that upload this to some another thread to, to perform this operation. So it's also possible. And, uh, as I understand, you also you need to define like correct partition decay or something like that. Well, I, yeah. I, I so remember if you mentioned about this, so when you want to scale it, you should like this, like have something like distributed key to so all the data are like related to all the streams or well, to all partitions like uh, in the like yeah, if you have a topic with just one partition, uh, by scaling your application it will not gain any benefit because there was no another instance that running was. It's going to be just only one instance that running against this partition. So you need to um, you need to test. You need to plan what kind of like a throughput is like desirable for for this uh, particular application and things like that. So also if. Uh, <coughs> If you don't have a key and you're just producing with some messages without the keys, it's also fine because in this case it will use just a run robin and they equally balance mm -hmm. these messages across all partitions. Uh, it's going to be handled uh, automatically by uh, by Kafka. Uh, uh, but in this case, it would be difficult to process and uh, like a, because you need to do afterwards. You need to do rekeying. After that, you need to figure out what's this message information you can use as a key in order to have this parallel processing it's a it's a it's a all these tools they still follows the like a map reduce uh, paradigm so when you um, before you can do actual calculation and get the final result you need to spread this on the on certain chunks on certain tra uh, the charts partitions and after that, you perform, perform computation within this partition, and after that, you um, reduce this result back to one definite number. So it's um, there's no there's no magic, there's no like free lunch, but it's just you know once you play by the rules of the framework and the system, you will get a pretty good numbers in terms of. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact. This application, like the control center, is a Kafka Streams application. So whatever it shows here, like this, this like real-time consumer lag, like, it's actually uh, runs Kafka Streams inside this application. It doesn't. If you um, if you go to these topics and then go show internal topics, control center have mm -hmm. um, a lot of data that's stored inside inside Kafka. So for example, there's a store um, that monitoring stream of every one minute. Three minutes, five minutes. So all this like internal information, like information about alerts. So Kafka Streams is is, is a powerful tool, and we actually, you know, again, drinking our own champagne um, and build our tool that we have a commercial support and things like that based on this tool. So we're putting our mouth where our, our we're putting money where our mouth is. So yeah. So in order to scale the number of consumers, you have to. Can't scale past the number of partitions, but obviously there must be a trade-off in terms of like number of partitions. Otherwise, you know, you can hundred. Yeah. What What are you looking at in terms of uh, sizing? Um, in terms of sizing, it's, it's a good, it's a very good question, and there's no, I cannot answer this with one word. Just use hundred partitions. Right. Um, the um. um there are some economical reasons for number of partitions because one partition, it's a file, but actually it's three files. It has uh, some information about uh, actual data. There's some indexes, some some additional metadata within one partition. So if you have a like a big number of partitions, it's a big number times three open files on this system. Okay. Next thing is that. Um, 
you what's what's the replication factor? How many copies of this partition will be stored on another node? I didn't talk about this, but Kafka provides this replication capabilities of your topics. So in case of one of the Kafka broker nodes will go down, mm -hmm. your data still will be there. Um, uh, another thing is that information about partitions is something that Kafka uh, considers a metadata, and this metadata also stored in another system that I didn't talk about. It's called Zookeeper. Zookeeper mm -hmm. have this information. There is a Kafka, uh, one of the Kafka brokers um, that are responsible for handling some of the situations called Controller. Controller has full topology of uh, Kafka cluster, including the information about partitions. It's additional um, uh, space in uh, Java heap for this particular broker. And there is multiple trade-offs. There's two great blog posts uh, on the, our blog by Jun Rao, he's one of the founders and he's, uh, he's uh, like, a, like a principal engineer in that company. And he's talking about uh, two years ago or something like that, he's talking about the number of partitions. And he was published a blog post just recently when he was talking about how we improve this in Kafka 2.0, what kind of improvements were done and how you choose the right number of partitions. But essentially, number of partitions will depend on of the things that on uh, what's your retention, what's your um, desired throughput. Um, and he has basically a formula that um, you put some of the thought about this, like what kind of your um, desired throughput, what's desired like application, what's the retention, um, and you will get. And also it's important to understand like how much space you have on your Kafka brokers uh, nodes. So there's m many uh, moving parts. Good thing about Kafka, there's like lots of things to configure. Mm -hmm. uh, good thing about, uh, bad thing about Kafka, that there are too many things to you know, configure and consider. <laughs> um, some of the things that we're working is also is kind of having like a tiered storage. So basically it allows you to have some hot storage where your data, like real-time data, for example, collected. But some of the data that you probably can use uh, someday, but you don't need this right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can offload this to another, more maybe like a cold storage type of thing. Um, that allows you kind of sort of have less thought about how much partitions or how much data, how much, uh, uh, how uh, disks, like what, how big a disk is supposed to be. So, um, the, the, those uh, blog posts are pretty cool. If well, you just, just, just Google uh, something like, okay, so we'll just, <laughs> I don't use Google, but let's give it a try. Um, <laughs> uh, how to choose? Yeah, well, I think uh, an important factor is that Zookeeper, the more partitions you have, the more work Zookeeper has to do yeah. mm -hmm. to like do leader election. Right. So you can't go crazy. Yeah, so um, so you can have right now, like, the this is uh, what we tested. You probably can have more, but this is what we tested. We can say, yeah, 200k partitions per cluster. So now, say, you have a five nodes in the cluster. So in this case, it gives us 40k partitions per node, um, which is quite significant. Uh, it, in this case, it also includes some of the replicas uh, and, and, and things like that, but this is a uh, this is number that you can you can you can have from perspective of your application um like when we when we're creating topic for example if, uh, we have some opinionated ideas how much partitions you want to have um well, start you can over provision and it's all so in this case you don't need to change it uh, but again when we have a 60 partitions, it not necessarily means that you need to run 60 instances of your application. You can even run 10. In this case, each application will have a 10 partitions. Oh, sorry, it's, uh, six partitions. And uh, we'll run this like a six task. It still would be better than running like one application with all these like tasks. So it's only thing that you need to consider, like what's the, um, how many tasks it will be running, what's the memory consumption of this application will be. And again, uh, the monitor, uh, monitor, measure, and see how it will perform in your case, because different cases are uh, different. What kind of the serialization you use, what kind of, uh, like if you're using Java serialization, using Avro, or using Protobuf, or something else. Um, like what's the 
what's the size of message, what's the configuration of producer to consume, or how often they commit the, the information. So there's, again, too many things. Yeah, it, it, it's probably, yeah, it's probably like the choosing number of partitions, it's actually uh, full-blown talk that June did at the Strata this year, so. Uh, you probably can find something on, on YouTube uh, to, to, to learn more about this. Yes? Are there any use cases left in more traditional things like Reddit? No. <laughs> uh, so in these situations where you don't care about losing your messages, when you don't care about ordering, when you don't care about uh, scaling your uh, uh, the messaging system, it still can use it. You know, for simple like a message uh, passing, it's still okay, right? Um, the things that Kafka have uh, as a built-in, for example, this built-in replication, because the idea to have distributed uh, system was from day one. Right, not like okay. So we have this. Uh, we can run uh, our messaging system on one node, and after that we have a ceiling of something. Okay, let's figure out how we're gonna run this in distributed mode. Uh, but it also will require you to think. Okay, are you gonna be replicating all the messages, or are you gonna be also sharding? How you will shard? Is it gonna be automatic sharding? And again, you're eventing, eventing either you know some sort of like a database because like sharding. It's the, the best thing that we have so far in terms of distributing data across multiple nodes. Um, yeah, sometimes uh, if you have a if you want to have a like a small little message queue, it's okay to use uh, whatever you want to use. It, it's Kafka uh, have messaging um, message message queue capabilities just of one only one of the things that you. Right. Um, we also like we we develop for one of the customers we develop a, a JMS client so their apps can switch to Kafka but they don't need to rewrite their apps so so that's why we kind of reduce number of use cases that this application can do because they're still using like JMS listener or like a message driven bin type of thing and uh, just run run their their application so. Um, probably there is. I'm biased, you know. You, I'm a wrong person to to, to ask this question. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, so the and again, the traditional messaging systems they don't give you any guarantee about order. For many people, many use cases, it's just a killer. So they they cannot afford getting messages out of order because if you're getting messages out of order and you still need to have order, you need to somehow make sense out of it. You need to do some sort of reconciliation, reprocessing turn this into, you know, you need to figure out this order. Kafka does this like for free out of the box. So, and yeah, we covered scalability, ordering, and uh, the, the storage. I think they would have a role whenever you don't have enough resources for a cluster. Like say, IoT applications, embedded systems, factory storage, there's no spot for a cluster. But, but, <laughs> but, uh, like, connect from the other side of thing. It's, uh, you know, you can have a, uh, on your, on the factory floor, you can have uh, uh, just a connector that will accumulate the state and push into Kafka. Like, we have a MQTT proxy that uh, knows how to work in the standard protocol to collect this uh, data from the sensors or whatever device is supporting. And in this case, these devices don't know about the like, existence of the Kafka. They know there's some like a the MQTT endpoint. And it's a good point that, you know, probably you don't want to have a cluster, but you still can. Uh, using, there's a, uh, there's like Mirror Maker, there's a replicator, a tool that allows you to have a copy of your, you know, local Kafka cluster from one place to be shipped to the, uh, to the like head office. Or only you can do some of the local pre-processing some data, but like head office only interested in like aggregated results. You can do some of the things on the on the edge, uh, and after that, just use this tool like a replicator to. Uh, so we can have this different uh, type of topologies. Not necessarily it's going to be like a one-to-one -one replication, but also it can be kind of like a snowflake type of topology with the. Um, 
different. It, it depends. So it, some some of the things require, you know, the planning and the, the figuring out like what what you want to do from the tool, what you want to do, for, what to, what do you want from the tool, and what do you want from you know this particular cluster. We have a um, we have a customers where Kafka runs on the ships, it's sailing. It's in the in, in the in ocean stuff. It runs inside the ships when it get back. It synchronize the some of the data that they collected also like uh, some monitoring data some of the telemetry uh, data from uh, from the ships and after that they dump it back to um, the main data center huh. so like it's a it's not like a uh, what's, what's the name of this <laughs> eventually available apps but it's eventually available clusters right mm -hmm. so you you run this we have another customer that um, they like big in organizing events like a SAS, um, Microsoft Ignite type of event, and they run Kafka, you know, when they on the on the expo floor, and after that, when they because their systems work through 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 the Kafka, and after that, they can take the system to data center to synchronize with some of the data, or it can synchronize in background because they don't don't know what's gonna be. Uh, speed of internet so they can do a, like slower uplink because they maybe don't need to have all the data immediately but it's good to have eventually all right cool thank you so much for uh, your time i hope i uh, explained something about the things um and again twitter you know how to find me. Um, you know how to find me there. If you have any uh, any questions, yeah, feel free.